He's a man whose comments often hit the headlines. And mostly just because people are surprised that someone of his stature is speaking out and speaking out so boldly. I'm talking about um, an industrialist who epitomizes Atmanirbhar Bharat long before the slogan was coined and doesn't pull his punches when criticizing government policy. I'm pleased to welcome to the show today Rajiv Bajaj. Uh, Mr. Bajaj, thank you for speaking with us. This has been a long term time coming. Great to have you on the channel today. And just want to start by getting your thoughts because we're speaking, um, you know, at the beginning of Unlock 1.0, a lot of offices are back today. People have started going back to work in bits and pieces. What is your take on how we stand and where we stand? Well, Tamanna, first of all, I'm glad you. Um... Uh, you invited me and I'm uh, pleased with your choice of words when you say he's a critic of government policy because people seem to think I'm a critic of the government. You know, I'm not a political animal. I'm not a critic of the government or of anybody in government. But yes, uh, if there is a policy or the other, which in my view uh, is inimical to my industry or my business or my employees, then I think it's my responsibility to uh, speak about it, and that's all I do. Uh, so let's move on to uh, to unlock one. And I think um, uh, currently the process of unlocking is a little, uh, you know, stop and start, a little erratic, a little haphazard. It gets better with every day. But even now, the fundamental issue is this, uh, uh, to my mind, that uh, the lesser problem around us is the flu virus. Uh, the bigger problem around us is the fear virus. You know, for about 10 weeks, uh, people have uh, been repeatedly told, um, uh, you know, that we are in the midst of a very dangerous situation from which there is almost no escape unless you, you hide at home. Um, and this is proving to be a big hurdle uh, in re-establishing uh, smooth operations because uh, in every locality, at least where I live uh, in Pune and what I know of my plants uh, in Pune and Aurangabad, um, you know, everybody is taking it upon himself to be the custodian uh, of uh, everyone around him. Um, and this is not allowing things um, to start up as smoothly as perhaps um, uh, the government uh, intends for it to be. Uh, from my point of view, I would make two simple points. One, I would say I continue to be perplexed by why we have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, you know, all of us can go to office uh, from seven in the morning to seven in the evening, but a few of us cannot move around at night um, after nine o'clock. This makes no sense to me. Uh, and it, it really affects plants like ours um, uh, that need to operate in the second shift to be able to uh, produce at some reasonable capacity. Uh, you know, because just in the first shift with uh, distancing, it is impossible to, to produce a, a whole lot. And secondly, I do not understand why people People, uh, healthy people, young people, robust people in the age group 21 to 60 are not allowed to simply get on with their lives, whether it's to go to office, whether it's to go to the gym, whether it's to go to the park, uh, even go to the restaurant, you know, with precautions, uh, of course. I simply don't uh, understand uh, where that is coming from. Okay, two very important points uh, you've made, uh, uh, Mr. Bajaj, and we'll go into them in detail. But I must come to the political point, because uh, for some reason, that's what everyone talks about. How come, uh, you know, this industrialist is coming out and speaking? And I remember a comment you made um, just about a month ago when you were unhappy with the way the Maharashtra government was opening up the um, lockdown and allowing plants to function. So I know that you're critical of government policy. But have you found yourself bracketed in this, you know, two camp sort of war because you've been speaking out? What has been the outcome of this? No, never. In fact, I, I say to whoever uh, feels concerned or anxious about me that, look, uh, A, I am not here to talk about a political subject. I don't talk about India and Pakistan. I don't talk about Hindu and Muslim. I don't talk about CA and NRC because that is not my circus, uh, you know. But when my business is affected, 
when I am expected to continue to employ and pay my people, when my dealers and suppliers are affected, then I think it is my circus. These are my monkeys. And, uh, you know, I need to speak up uh, on their behalf. So uh, I have, to the best of my knowledge, voiced my opinion in public only when it concerns me and my business. Um, secondly, I have said this consistently, that I have never so far faced any backlash or uh, any repercussion for having done so. You know, I have not called anybody names. I have not alleged that somebody is corrupt. I have not called anybody a bully. So I don't understand uh, why why people should feel offended. And, uh, uh, you know, I, and this is what I say to people that I have absolutely no cause to believe that what I am being, what I'm saying is being misunderstood. Sure, some times uh, on, on a matter like this, uh, I may have a different point of view um, and, and I'm not claiming to be an expert, uh, but I have a right to ask some questions and that's all I've done. Uh, so yeah, the short answer is uh, no one has, uh, uh, you know, taken umbrage to it. Uh, nobody has called me uh, and, um, uh, you know, been mean to me. On the contrary, for example, I can share with you that very early in the lockdown, I would say sometime towards the middle of April, uh, post a couple of my interviews, a very senior minister um, called me um, from Mumbai. Uh, and uh, uh, he said to me that the prime minister has watched your interviews and I have been asked to let you know uh, that he appreciates your point of view. Uh, I always tell people, for example, uh, when my quadricycle was stuck for 10 years, uh, thanks to... Uh, let's say, some tactics by some of my competition, eight of those 10 years uh, were during the UPA. It is, in fact, with the NDA government and with the support of people like Mr. Amitabh Kant and Shri Nitin Gadkari uh, that I actually got permission for Bajaj to launch the quadricycle. So, you know, sometimes people see ghosts that don't exist. I don't see them. So do you think that uh, there is an unreasonable sort of hesitation when your peers don't speak out? I mean, Indian industry is notorious for uh, being very politically correct and uh, saying even lesser than they perhaps should. Well, I guess it's a case of to each his own, you know. I mean, some people are comfortable speaking up uh, uh, and some people are not. And I and I think they are both right. Uh, one should do what one is comfortable doing. People, on the other hand, also speak up. On, on a lot of other issues, a lot of other, let's say, political uh, issues. And I, I don't care to speak up on that. And I don't think I owe anybody an explanation for that. But I will say this, that when people in business, when people in entertainment, when people in sport, when other uh, people, prominent people in other uh, walks of life can say so much about a poor elephant uh, that died, surely they can say a few things about millions of people who walked home. Wow. Uh, Mr. Vajaj, I want to come to the question of the lockdown. You've been unequivocal in your view that we started the lockdown too early and it went on for too long. You've called it a draconian lockdown and now we are opening up when infections were high. I want to turn around and ask you what you think should have been done differently. Remember when the lockdown was put in place uh, in late March, March 24 to be precise, we still didn't know what coronavirus is going to look like. Now, about 70 odd days later, we're looking at a large number of cases in India, but relatively fewer deaths. Would you concede that's because of a stringent lockdown that went on for so long? You know, you're asking me uh, this question after I read in the papers today that uh, our previous chief minister, Mr. Fadnavis, uh, said that my view on this doesn't count because I'm not an expert. Um, and, you know, frankly, I have to say he's right. Uh, I am not an expert. Uh, you know, and if I might uh, uh, take a shot back at him, I would say, sir, uh, and I've met Devendra Ji a number of times. He's a very fine gentleman and a very fine politician. And I would say to him, yes, I'm not an expert, which is why I don't think that, uh, you know, lockdown karke, thali baja ke, diya jala ke, aur pool barsa ke, uh, corona... You know, but more seriously, uh, I don't necessarily have answers, but I do have some thoughts or some questions. Number one, I do not understand why we looked west when we should have looked east, because we are an Asian country with 
Asian levels of immunity, temperature, uh, demography in terms of young population, perhaps a resistance to thrombosis, which is important in the context of this virus, etc. So first of all, I want the government to explain to me if they would care to, uh, why is it that they looked west? Number two, I do not understand uh, completely why those who are in the age group of 21 to 60, which is largely the working population, those of them that are healthy and robust, uh, why were they kept at home and not allowed to go to work uh, wearing a mask, keeping a distance? Why were they not allowed to go to work? What is the data uh, uh, based on which uh, we put everybody inside and virtually ground the wheels of the economy to a halt? This I don't understand. Number three, I don't at this moment buy the argument that this early and hard lockdown has limited infections or deaths in India quite simply because look at what's happening in Japan. Japan is a graying society and to the best of my knowledge, there are fewer than 1,000 deaths in Japan. Look at Thailand, a society in which, quote unquote, everybody mixes with everyone. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they have like 100 or 200 deaths. Maybe it's double digit also, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, look at a small country like Cambodia, uh, five or ten deaths, uh, Singapore, etc. So my point is that most Asian countries have reported uh, very low infections and very low deaths as compared to the West. And I don't think it's the reflected glory of the Indian lockdown. It's because Asian countries for, or Asian population for whatever reason are behaving differently. And finally, uh, my quarrel with the logic of uh, the lockdown is that it was ostensibly done to flatten the curve so that the medical infrastructure could catch up. You know, the math will never add up on that. In 1.4 billion people, if you take 10% who are elderly, 10% who are uh, hypertensive, 10% who are diabetic, so on and so forth, you're talking of three, 400 million people. Um, there is no way to flatten that curve. You know, even if you were to lock down for a year, uh, you would need a capacity of 5 or 10 million beds, ventilators uh, with the nurses and doctors to be able to deal with that kind of a population. Uh, so the math just doesn't add up there. These are, I think, four fundamental reasons uh, why you know, I don't understand uh, yeah. what, what the motive behind the lockdown. Just as a as a, a counter example, and you're right, you 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 know you are simply putting your opinion out there. It's for policymakers to figure out how to do. And I don't think there is any way for anyone to know what is right or wrong. For example, let's take a country like Sweden, lauded by everyone for uh, you know not imposing any lockdown. Now they're sitting and questioning each other because they have some of the highest mortality rates in the world. <laughs> this is an unprecedented situation. Forget about any government because, you know, you really can't put yourself in that position. But if I ask you, Mr. Bajaj, if you had no restrictions and you go back to the month of March, would you have done things differently in terms of how, you know, you uh, let your employees come into work or kept them at home or, you know, how you managed your business or even your family, how often they went out and exposed themselves or not? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Sweden because I think this example is either misunderstood or it is widely misquoted. Sweden did not continue business as usual. Uh, Sweden advocated uh, uh, hygiene, masks, distancing, and particularly that one take care of the elderly and the immunocompromised. Uh, they did all of that. What they did not do is to go and lock up everybody else that was young and healthy, irrespective of taking all these precautions. So Sweden did not go from one extreme of business as usual uh, to the other extreme. Sweden found the middle path in doing this. And uh, we have to wait uh, to see how the data matures out of Sweden, because as the Swedish chief uh, scientist has said, sure, Today, uh, the death rate in Sweden is higher than that of our Scandinavian neighbors who locked up um, harder than we did. But let's watch what happens in 6 to 12 months' time when they have opened up. Uh, 
um, you know, let's watch how they catch up. Because he made a very uh, chilling um, uh, statement. He said, the hallmark of this pandemic is that the healthy and the young are silently waiting to infect the old and the vulnerable, you know, which means that the virus is always going to be around waiting for you to unlock. And this is exactly what has happened in India, that as we are unlocking and beginning to meet each other, uh, and also as we are testing more, uh, the cases are going up. So what would I have done differently? Fundamentally, I would have exercised all these precautions um, in terms of, uh, you know, the mask, the distancing and stuff like that. Keep the elderly and immunocompromised away safe. But I would have said to everyone else, uh, you know, get on with your work. Now, the argument, one of the arguments made against that, for example, is that people live with the elderly or with the unwell and how will they manage it? I think we have to grant people uh, that they have the sense to make those choices for themselves. I mean, don't you and I have the choice to decide whether, well, rightly or wrongly, whether or not we want to smoke. We have that right, knowing fully well that smoking kills. It says so on the packet of cigarettes. Uh, people, unfortunately, exercise the choice not to wear their seat belt or not to wear their helmet. That doesn't mean you shut down Bajaj Auto because riding a two-wheeler is not safe. So we have to leave it to people uh, to make that final choice in the uh, final mile and not micromanage their lives. That's my point. Okay, let me come, since you brought up Bajaj Auto, let me come to, uh, you know, that very important part of, uh, you know, why we were keen to talk to you as well. Uh, there's been a call for Atmanirbhar Bharat. And I think uh, there are few Indian companies that typify the Atmanirbhar Bharat made in India formula long before the slogans were coined, uh, such as Bajaj Auto. Today, this idea is being seen as a solution to lifting up the Indian economy post the COVID-19 pandemic. How workable do you think that idea is? And what are the challenges to truly becoming this kind of a company that is an Indian company supplying to the world? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I would say that there's a lot of people who seem to think that uh, Atma Nirbhar stands for exclusion. You know, the exclusion of uh, multinational companies or of foreign brands and their products, etc. Uh, I personally don't think that is what the Prime Minister meant by Atma Nirbhar or that's what the government of India means by Atma Nirbhar. Um, I think what they mean by that is quite simply excellence. Uh, and to me, excellence means to be world-class and to be world-class means to be global. Uh, and, and that's what we pursued at Bajaj Auto. Uh, 15 years back, we were a company that exported almost nothing. Today, we are a company that exports about half of what it makes under normal circumstances, uh, which means we are a globally competitive company. Um, we, we call ourselves the world's favorite Indian uh, because we, uh, we compete successfully in more than 70 countries across the world. So this to me is the meaning of Atman Nirbhar. And if this is what uh, the government means, then I could not agree with it more. Uh, you asked me, uh, you know, what stands in the way of this? Well, at a very fundamental level, uh, what stands at the, uh, in the way of this is, is simply greed. Um, you know, uh, Companies try to extend uh, the scope of their business and they try to extend their brands um, into areas uh, which are not uh, core to them. Uh, and by doing so, they diffuse their brand and they dilute their competitiveness. I mean, just to illustrate, uh, let me give you these examples. How absurd does Volvo Salt sound to you? Quite absurd, but Tata Salt sounds fine, right? How absurd does Jeep Holiday Resort sound to you? But Mahindra Holiday Resort sounds fine. How absurd does BMW Juicer Mixer Grinder sound to you? Pretty absurd. But a Bajaj Juicer Mixer Grinder sounds fine. So at, at the heart of business, your greatest asset is your brand. And if you have to be a global brand as distinct uh, from a local one, then you need to be very sharp. In other words, the best advice I ever got when we were pursuing a strategy of being globally competitive was narrow your focus. The narrower you are, the sharper you are, the deeper you will go. Uh, because then you have an identity uh, that is clear to everyone. And by doing the same thing again and again, you will probably do it better than anyone else does. Now, every sports person 
every artist, every musician, every chef, every doctor understands the virtue of specializing in this fashion. But unfortunately, business people, especially in emerging markets, don't because the market is so large that while they talk global, unfortunately, they largely act local. Uh, and they try to extend and expand their business and their brand to capture as much of the local business as possible. And then this doesn't work. And that is why you may remember that 15 years back, the first thing, you know, the first step on the path to globalization is that of sacrifice. Bajaj had to sacrifice its scooter business in order to put every man, every rupee and every minute behind its motorcycle business at a time when we were... A, uh, you know, a pygmy in the world of motorcycles and say to ourselves that one day we will be a force to reckon with as a global motorcycle manufacturer. Um, what are the three most in, uh, important ingredients, therefore, that has helped us? Well, since uh, the government is fond of uh, acronyms, uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, our secret sauce is called FIT, F-I-T. F stands for a sharp focus. It all starts with a sharp global focus, in our case, to make the best motorcycles in the world. Yeah. I, I stands for a unique idea, uh, a big idea. In our case, as someone actually outside the company articulated recently, Bajaj seems to be able to put together motorcycles that embody European design, Japanese quality and Indian prices. That may sound simplistic, but it's a very, very powerful idea. I think we do it uh, very well. At one end, we are selling a boxer into Africa for $400 and making money on it. On the other hand, we are selling a KTM into Europe for 6,000 euros and making a lot of money on it. Not many companies have the ability to demonstrate such versatility. And finally, coming to T, the T stands for an aligned team. You know, uh, and this I owe to Shah Rukh Khan, who told me once that he read a book by a famous director who said at the end of his book, we will all make a great movie only if we are all making the same movie. And we say to ourselves all the time at Bajaj that we will all make a great bike only if we are all making the same bike. If somebody wants to make a cheap bike, somebody wants to make an expensive bike, somebody wants to make a fast bike, somebody wants to make a high mileage bike, we are not going to make the worst of all worlds. Bajaj uh, success story is well known. It all started, you know, with the Pulsar. I want to understand from you your view in the current day context. When we say that we want to become Atmanirbhar Bharat, we're speaking about this as a philosophy which goes beyond one company, one sector. What are the hurdles Indian industry faces to achieve that goal? Okay, let's give them one more acronym to think about. The four L's, you know, the time, the, the time honored four L's we have. Problems. I have to ask you, are you coming up with these on the spot? Or have you planned why, these? Why, 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 why should you feel otherwise? <laughs> um, so the time honored, the time honored problems have been land. Even today, the acquisition of land is a, is a problem for companies. Uh, the second L is labor. Uh, there's all sorts of issues. We know very well with labor. The third is logistics. <clears throat> Call it infrastructure if you want. I mean, from suppliers through dealers to ports to ships uh, is it, it, an ongoing problem. And lastly, legislation. I mean, I just referred to our quadricycle, the cube. A innovation that could have taken the three-wheeler forward, made it safer and greener, uh, was held back for for eight or 10 years. So these are the problems. But what I want to say is this, because I think it's important to put a positive message out. Um, you know, that yes, uh, we are proud of the fact that today we export half of what we make and very significantly so to, to develop markets to the US, to, uh, to Europe, to UK, to Japan, to Australia. And I think there is a, uh, you know, four horizon uh, plan that one can, uh, one can put together for this purpose. The first thing we did was to focus on countries in the subcontinent around us, you know, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, etc. Our strategy in one simple word was same. They are very similar markets. You take the same product, same prices, you go there, it works. 
This is the first step. I think every Indian company can grow its business and be more Atmanirbhar and be more global if it chooses to do this. The second is to go to the continent of Africa. Uh, you, you, you may be surprised and you should, certainly should be proud to know that every third motorcycle sold in Africa is a Bajaj motorcycle. Um, 15 years ago, that, that was zero. And in Africa, in a simple word, uh, the strategy is the strategy of better. Because largely, this was a market dominated by the Chinese. Uh, and in Bajaj, they found a better product, although one that was a little more expensive, because we can't make it as cheap as the Chinese do, because our quality is at a different level. So that's the second, I think, option that is also available. Uh, to to a lot of Indian companies and and a lot of them are actually leveraging these these options towards becoming Atmanirbhar or excellent. The third is when you go to the markets in LATAM and ASEAN, which are dominated by the Japanese. It's not easy to compete um, in these markets uh, from Brazil and Colombia to Indonesia and Thailand. And here you start competing more on perception. Uh, than on um, uh, on reality, which means that in terms of what you offer, because you are part of a technologically mature industry, you are unlikely to offer a product which is much superior, but you have to create a perception of being different in the marketplace. How you do that in terms of engineering and marketing determines your success. And finally, uh, when you go to the developed markets that I mentioned, I think in one word, the strategy is to be niche. Um, and uh, and that's what we've done with KTM. We are doing that with Husqvarna. Hopefully, we will uh, more than repeat that success with Triumph. And uh, if I may say so, you have to do it very humbly because your brand is not going to find any traction uh, in those markets. You know, it doesn't matter how good a Casio watch is, it is never an Omega. You know, the way we will recover and the timeline with which we will recover. We've uh, seen, of course, a massive hit to the economy because of the lockdown, overall demand <laughs> is depressed. Um, do you see demand returning in your space specifically and overall? Well, I think um, it's very industry specific for us. Rationally, logically, I would say yes, as a combination of two things, mainly one, the suppressed uh, demand uh, of the last three months has to come back at some point sooner rather than later. Um, and secondly, certainly there will be a structural change away from buses and metros and trams or trains or what have you to motorcycles uh, and to small three-wheelers as opposed to big three-wheelers. So uh, this is going to be a favorable uh, tailwind for a company like Bajaj Auto. On the other hand, uh, as I said in the beginning, there is more than just a flu virus out there. There is a fear virus out there. So how soon will people muster the courage in the face of this pandemic in uh, in anxiety for their jobs or salary cuts, uh, how soon will they find it in themselves to come back? One doesn't know. I think the best thing, the most sensible thing to do is to wait and watch. But I am a believer that <clears throat> coming out of a crisis, uh, it is in the nature of the human being to uplift his mood in some fashion. Um, so I think uh, the recovery is likely to take us by surprise. Uh, it is likely to be stronger than expected. Um, and I would certainly like to believe that at least by the second half of the year, uh, we start coming back to a, a normal level of business. Do you think there are some things which will change uh, forever? Everyone keeps talking. You know, there, there are two stark news that I hear very often. One is that uh, soon the COVID-19 pandemic and all of this fear will be behind us at some point. We'll get back to normal. And the other is that some things are going to change forever. Maybe work from home is one of them. Uh, do you think that there has been a paradigm shift in some areas? Well, in terms of uh, working, um, I'm a little amused by this because for the last 20 years, I was looking and uh, at and listening to stories about the campuses of Google and Apple um, and Porsche 
and all these wonderful companies and looking at the kind of campuses or working infrastructure that they build for their people uh, so that people want to come to work and you know it's it's so invigorating it's also so comfortable and convenient and every possible service you can imagine is available there and you can get your hair cut and you can go to the gym and you can get your stuff laundered and somebody will go and shop with all of that and now suddenly we are saying exactly the opposite i don't buy this uh, and i don't want to buy this because we just spent a lot of money uh, expanding uh, rebuilding our campus at at akurdi uh, it's unfinished because of what happened uh, so i would very much like to believe that there is a lot of value to getting people to work uh, to coming together face to face um, you know human beings are about energy we are not just uh, you know uh, about facts and data and logic and that energy has to be felt uh, uh, when you are together so i think at least in our kind of business except for very few people who are so called individual performers or specialists i would like to think that uh, or i believe that most people need to come back to work um, at least most days of the week in terms of uh, change outside of the business you know what bill gates said right he said in the short term we overestimate what's possible in the long term we underestimate it so i think in the short term what is important for a company like us is to make a even sharper proposition to to the customer and what does this mean it means that in our aspirational brands like a pulsar a avenger a dominar a ktm we must make a irresistible value proposition not by discounting Uh, but by pressing upon the levers of product first and foremost and communication and price etc we must make an irresistible value proposition but with our aspirational brands i think this will really get people coming out of the good works um, at at uh, double speed so i think this is one thing which is very important in the short term i think in the long term um, i think this is uh, uh, you know this awareness of the environment etc and how interdependent our health is with it is really going to move uh, the electric vehicle movement forward uh, mm-hmm. there's a lot the government has to do in that respect i think in terms of localization policy in terms of infrastructure in terms of battery disposal etc so in terms of policy uh, and they and they are working on it uh, i know niti ayog is working very vigorously in this direction and there's a lot like manufacturers like like us have to do uh, to put product out there Uh, to educate customers uh, and to create a market where none exists uh, so you know i think this is a big opportunity for india in the longer term and we should not uh, we should not underestimate it last question mr bajaj what has been your personal learning and you know eye opening moment through this lockdown what is what are the realizations that you are going to be exiting with I think the most important would be how quickly people can adapt when they have to uh, you know so otherwise uh, you know as managers we are all about being cautious and measured and step by step uh, in our approach but when called upon uh, to to respond swiftly we can i mean you know at my level if i may say so there is not much that i can do or i did in terms of getting plants started in terms of getting uh, enabling suppliers uh, in terms of facilitating dealers but i have watched in amazement uh, how my senior team and everyone down uh, to the frontline people have used this time um, you know to to establish the so called new normal so i think uh, this should mean that we all go back with uh, much greater confidence in ourselves uh, because you know resources are important uh, you know heritage is important but nothing is more important than your courage your confidence your ability to be resourceful to be imaginative to think out of the box and i think the you know uh, not just industry i think the people of this country have demonstrated that and i think that is why we will all come back stronger well um uh, to that uh, optimism and uh, that good note i would like to thank you for joining us today and for thank always you. speaking your mind we need more of that not less that was rajiv bajaj for you thank you so much thank you thank you very much